Hello, and welcome to uh, another episode of Surgical Pathology, Digital Slide Review, and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel. Uh, our program is a, a service of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, the joint venture with the Digital Pathology Association and Path Presenter. Our cases uh, today also uh, come from of the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, where I'm on the faculty. Uh, here's one of the symbols of our campus, the uh, well-known statue of the sower. And I hope that's uh, a degree of what we're able to do is sow some thoughts and ideas that will be a blessing to you in your work. So uh, today is of a 52-year-old woman who has abnormal uterine bleeding. That's a fairly common symptom and uh, something that uh, presents the challenge of then usually getting an endometrial biopsy or curatized specimen. Are particularly challenges be challenging because there are so many different uh, causes for uh, menopausal perimenopausal bleeding. Uh, we can just have normal cycling end endometrium that may or may not be uh, disturbed by some sort of a hormonal uh, change. Uh, we can have inflammatory lesions, chronic endometritis or acute endometritis. Uh, we can have submucosal masses, polyps, uh, leiomyomas, and those sorts of things that can create uh, bleeding symptoms and uh, enter into our differential. And then the most vexing uh, issue is, of course, the hyperplasia and carcinoma issues that people are often uh, most anxious to exclude. And to make matters more interesting, uh, they can be mixed up. You can have several of the above and that uh, presents challenges. So let's look at our slide. Here's a typical uh, field from a curatage specimen. As you see, it's very fragmented. There's no architecture or orientation to help us. Uh, we do see that uh, the tissue is fairly cellular. Uh, we can see some solid areas. We can see some glandular tissue, uh, some mixtures of the two. Um, and so looking at uh, this case, we would suspect here that uh, probably we're in one of the proliferative uh, categories. So let's look in on this uh, tissue. Here we see some of this glandular tissue. Um, we see that these glands are irregular, variable sizes. Some are big, some have bulging uh, uh, tufting into the lumen. Some have uh, smaller lumens and so forth. Um, and the glands are very closely spaced. This is what we term back-to-back -back glands where the very little stroma in between the glandular tissues. Um, and you just see mostly glandular epithelium. Uh, this is most typically found in carcinomas. But some hyperplasia can also uh, present uh, with this uh, type of circumstance. Another feature that we can see at this magnification is that we have some stuff in the lumen we have a bit of carrier debris in the epithelium. So this is uh, the beginnings of what you might term a tumor diathesis, a little bit of necrotic and hemorrhagic debris uh, sloughing into the lumen. Uh, here you see just these uh, blue blobs of uh, carrierexis. Uh, let's go and look at another fragment, um, perhaps this one over here. Uh, we see more of this uh, glandular, glandular back to back appearance. And uh, then here we see a little bit of stroma. Now, it's important to always inspect the stroma that we have in these to make sure that we don't have uh, either a benign uh, accompanying this or uh, some sort of a, a high-grade uh, stroma malignancy. And here the stroma looks fairly bland or benign. Uh, so that's not part of the neoplastic process. <clears throat> Looking at a few more fragments here, uh, let's take a look down here. And, and I think we'll see that here we see a little bit of a, an alteration, a little bit of sort of streaming change to some of the tissues here, uh, maybe a little morular type of change, uh, almost at what we would term a more solid growth or more squamous metaplasia type of change uh, that can also occur frequently in endometrial carcinomas but also is a feature that's found uh, in hyperplasias. So we'll go up here. Someone conveniently marked this <clears throat> fragment. 
here we see this sort of streaming appearance here. And we see that some of these cells are mitotically active uh, as well. So this streaming sort of area would be an, an area of uh, metaplasia, metaplasia that can be seen in these tumors. Here again, not a sarcoma, because <clears throat> it's not a high-grade uh, malignancy, uh, but it is uh, either squamous metaplasia or a spindle shell cell change in the stroma of a low-grade carcinoma. I think we illustrated some of those in the, our recent case uh, that we looked at with uh, carcinosarcoma. So here we see another nice little area of uh, squamous metaplasia there. Right there, you see those squamous pearls uh, just uh, bulging right out uh, from the surrounding glandular tissue. So in the context of hyperplasia or neoplasia, classification has long been a, a challenge, and particularly what's been a challenge is achieving consistency. So the WHO classification from the late 90s had essentially a six-category classification ranging from benign to carcinoma with uh, simple and complex hyperplasias with and without atypia forming the middle ground and varying degrees of risk assigned with that. Performance with this uh, particular uh, system was not very good. As you see, consistency was only 28%. So more recently, uh, based on a lot of other work you, from the people in the, the European community as well as here uh, in the United States, um, looking at uh, endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia classification or looking at uh, other classification systems uh, both with uh, either simpler four group categories or just two group categories, have tried to see if they could improve on this. And as you can see down here at the bottom, uh, there's been quite a measure of improvement over those previous uh, uh, categories, uh, up to 60, 70 percent uh, improvement when we drop down to a two-category two category, uh, system. So, uh, in general, uh, benign hyperplasia, atypia, um, and atypical hyperplasia and carcinoma are uh, grouped together. Uh, the difficult distinction between atypical hyperplasia and carcinoma is no longer critical um, under these systems. In practice, I think most people still attempt to, to, to do that, um, to provide some uh, guidance. Uh, but it's not a uh, hard and fast uh, um, line that can ever be drawn. Um, and the internal consistency and the uh, inter-observer consistency is challenging. Here's another slide to maybe illustrate the, the low-grade group uh, that we've alluded to. I don't think anyone would put this group into the, this uh, case into the uh, a typical hyperplasia group. Just looking at it from low power, we can see there's glandular tissue uh, and there's a good amount of stroma and not much um, an alteration between the two. Now we may be looking at a polyp here because we do have a couple of thick walled vessels and some slightly altered stroma. This case nicely illustrates the presence of squamous morular metaplasia here uh, in these glands. Here's another view of what squamous metaplasia can look like uh, within the lumen of the glands. Um, and it's quite frequent in this particular sample. Uh, but looking around, we really don't see too much in the way of uh, increased gland to stroma ratio, so it doesn't really class, cross into the category. Uh, this fragment here uh, does have maybe a slightly increased uh, gland to stroma ratio, and as we look here, uh, we can see that these glands are fairly close. Some of them are touching, uh, but they're not back-to-back -back, as we saw in the other case. And we also don't see that luminal uh, debris. We don't see too much stratification. We don't see uh, too much complexity of the glandular architecture. There's a little bit of budding and branching, but not uh, much to be concerned about here. Uh, so this case would fit into the benign uh, hyperplasia category 
And here we'll look at this area over here as well. We see more of this uh, morular metaplasia, some dilated glands, and a little bit of architectural uh, abnormality. Here's a nice uh, branched gland here uh, with sort of uh, fingers and toes or knees uh, and, and elbows coming off the sides of the, gl of the gland uh, in various directions. So features that uh, we find tend to move things towards uh, hyperplasia and carcinoma. Uh, the most important feature, of course, is uh, the ratio of glands to stroma. Is it greater than 50%? <clears throat> and usually uh, inexperienced observers can make that distinction fairly well. Uh, then the next question is, do those glands look different than surrounding benign glands? In other words, is there complexity or are there nuclear features uh, different from the surrounding tissues uh, that may be more benign? And that would move it into the category of atypical hyperplasia or potentially carcinoma. Now, sometimes you will have benign glands surrounding to compare, and then you're more likely towards carcinoma. And then finally, we like to look for the presence of luminal necrosis or um, apoptotic debris. That tends to uh, be helpful in uh, defining uh, malignancy. Uh, it can occasionally be present in hyperplasias, but is virtually never seen in the benign, uh, non-atypical hyperplasias. Squamous metaplasia, as I've just illustrated, is not a particularly uh, useful feature in differentiating these. And so we do not recommend the use of that as a discriminant criteria. So to summarize our diagnosis for today's case, endometrial carcinoma, FIGO grade one, uh, less than 5% solid growth. Um, and uh, this patient uh, in some circumstances might be managed conservatively, but usually that would lead to uh, hysterectomy uh, in a otherwise uh, healthy, uh, low surgical risk patient. Thank you very much for joining me today. I hope that you've enjoyed this uh, conversation about these cases. Uh, please uh, subscribe to this channel. We intend to, so you won't miss uh, future uh, postings of uh, additional material. Uh, and if you have comments, we welcome them. I'll also post the links to these uh, slides and this presentation below. Uh, in the description so that you can look and explore the digital slide yourself uh, at greater leisure, and uh, hopefully that will help your learning as well. And until next time, thanks for joining us.